السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله حمدا وإجلالا لواهب النعم صلاة وسلاما على من أوتي جوامع الكلم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد After praising Allah and sending salam and salutations to the noble prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. He is one and he has no partners. And I also testify that the noble Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger and slave of Allah the Almighty. Respected Mashaykh, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, um, actually this subject that I have um, chosen to speak on it is very profound and deep and complex subject. I don't think I'm actually in a position to talk on this subject, but due to the immense confusion in society amongst the Muslims, I was compelled to uh, address this subject, the subject of tasawwuf between religion and innovation. Now, before I proceed, I would like to apologize and ask forgiveness if I am going to offend anybody because that won't be my intention. And I also ask forgiveness from Allah Taala for any mistakes that may occur during the next few moments. Of course, um, there is a very common word uh, amongst the Muslims and in the Noble Quran, in Hadith and Nabawiyah, in prophetic narrations, and that is known as At-Tazkiyah. Now I'd like to ask questions from, from the audience and uh, to the audience what do you know or what's your understanding on the word tazkiyah? What do you, or do you know the meaning of the word tazkiyah? Anybody here please? Help me and let's just speak together. What is the meaning of the word tazkiyah and have you heard of the word, word tazkiyah? Purification, good of the heart, of the soul, yeah? Any other meaning? Tazkiyah. Hmm? Any other meaning of tazkiyah? Recommendation? Did anybody apply for university recently? And you get a tazkiyah. Reference, recommendation. That, that's also uh, one of the meaning of tazkiyah. But the tazkiyah that we're talking about here is the purification of the soul, cleansing one's heart. This is tazkiyah mentioned in the Noble Quran and mentioned by the Noble Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, when Allah wa ta'ala spoke about, spoke about the noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his responsibilities, why he came to this world, he said in the noble Quran in Surah Al-Jum'ah, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم I seek refuge with Allah to protect us from the evil of shaytan, the accursed. Then he said, هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته That Allah the Almighty, he sent a messenger amongst the people of uh, of not knowledge, a rasul. What would be his responsibility? That he would recite the Quran. He would teach the. He would he would he would recite the ayat of Allah Taala. And he would purify them. He will clean them. So one of the responsibilities of the noble messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was at tazkiyah. He would zakki him. Mentioned in the noble Quran. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ And he will teach the book of Allah وَالْحِكْمَةِ and wisdom which obviously interpreted by the scholars of Islam as Sunnah of the Noble Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you see Allah the Almighty sent Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do what? First of all to recite the Quran then to purify the souls وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Purification of the soul mentioned in the middle of this verse in Surah Al-Jum'ah. And then we will give them the book and the wisdom, and if they were before, they were in a dark place. And then this is tazkiyah mentioned in the Noble Quran by Allah. But there is another word, also very common and well known amongst the Muslims in the Noble Quran and Sunnah, and that is ihsan. Now, what do you understand by the word ihsan? Please help me. What is ihsan? Hmm. 
Ihsan? Anybody knows what Ihsan means? Kind. Huh? Kind. Being kind. This is one of the meanings, yes. Excellence, Excellence is another meaning, yes. Being excellent in everything. That's also Ihsan. Any other meaning of Ihsan? It's the way you pray and life watching you or you are watching Allah. Good, this is what we're looking for. But also Ihsan means to step down from your right and offer that right to your fellow brother and sister in society. That's also Ihsan, compromising, flexibility, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving your rights to others. This is also an Ihsan. But Allah, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke about Ihsan in the hadith in the prophetic narrations. So there is a famous hadith known as the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Are you aware of the hadith of Jibreel? When Jibreel Amin alayhi salam, he came and he had a conversation with the noble prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And in that hadith, he asked few questions to the noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Please say sallallahu alayhi wasallam whenever you listen to the name of prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right. So when he came and he asked to Messenger of Allah, O Messenger of Allah, what's Iman? What is faith? So, Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ That you believe in Allah. وَمَلَائِكَتِي in his angels. وَكِتَابِي in his books. And then, to the end of the uh, sentence. And then he said, what is Islam? So obviously Islam said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشِرْكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا That you worship Allah and you do not associate any partnership with Allah. You don't ascribe any partnership with Allah. That's Islam. And at the end he asked, what is Ihsan? So then Prophet said, أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك. Meaning that you must or you should worship Allah as if you can see him. As if you can see him. And if you couldn't see him, if you couldn't feel like seeing him, then you need to feel that Allah is watching you at all time. Ibadah in its highest level, that Allah is watching you at all time. Muraqaba at daima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is monitoring you. Imagine you're working in a place and your manager is watching. How would you do your responsibility? How would you uh, uh, carry out your responsibilities? You'll be doing it in your best capacity, in your best level, according to your best capacity. Why? The manager is watching. So this is al ihsan, meaning. You must worship Allah as if you can see him, and if you couldn't see him, then Allah is watching you. Now, here, Messenger of Allah وسلم, is telling us that Islam, when we talk about Islam, there's three different degrees. Number one, you're a Muslim, and that's just you believe in Allah and His Messenger, you don't reject anything from Quran and Sunnah, you become Muslim. Then the second level is mu'min, that you become a true believer, you practice, you apply, whatever you learn, you, uh, you implement in your life, this is believer, mu'min. And the last degree is al-ihsan, that you become a muhsin, and that's the stage when you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all time. You are in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every moment. That's al-ihsan. Now, is there any dis disagreements? Is there any difference of opinions? Amongst the scholars of Islam from all lines and circles, whether the scholars Mashaykh of Salafiya, or the Mashaykh of Sufiya, or the Mashaykh of Dawbandiya, or the Mashaykh of even Barlaviya, is there a difference of opinions in these two things, Tazkiyah and Al Ihsan? I don't think any educated Muslim will disagree with these two points. Everybody agrees in Tazkiyah to Nafs and Al Ihsan. Why? Because they mentioned directly in the Noble Quran, in the uh, language of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. There is no any difference of opinions and nobody disagree with Tazkiyah and Ihsan. So we said purification of soul and Ihsan is excellence in Ibadah and worship. Now, when we talk about the worship of a Muslim, there is a two major types of worship. Right? Two major types of worship. Number one, Al-A'mal Al-Zahira. The outward worship. What are the outward worship? Give me some examples, please. Outward worship. A'mal al zahira Like people can see external. Allah barakfiq. Salah. Yes. What else? So when you pray, people can see. Um, yes, when you give charity in public, people can see. Uh, uh, hajj. When you perform the rituals of hajj, people can see. When you uh, are going to jihad, people can see that you are really fighting in the path of Allah. When you go and do da'wah in public, people can see you're doing da'wah. These are outward ibadah, outward worship. When you go and do, uh, uh, for example, teaching, 
when you teach uh, students and teaching uh, Islam and teaching generally is also outward so people can see. So this is called al-ibad al-zahira. That's the things that can be seen. The worship can be viewed. The worship can be seen. The outward worship. But then you have some of some other worships that are known as the inward worship. A'mal al-batina. What are they? Give me some examples, Bill, please. A'mal al-batina. The inward worship. Fasting. fasting, yes, uh, yes. Fasting is one of the actual inward words because people can't see if you're fasting unless they know. But yes, it can be counted as inward. Anything else? Hmm? Zikr, yes. If you're doing uh, uh, quietly, yes. But then part of the batina or the uh, inward worship, number one is sincerity. We know we have to pray, but what is the where is the place of qal or what is, where is the place of uh, uh, niya in, in in a person's uh, body? So the scholars of Islam say Mahallun Niya al Qalb. So heart and soul is the place of the niya intention. I don't know why you're praying. I don't know why you're you're fighting the path of Allah. Whether you're really sincerely fighting or you're are fighting so that you can you can be called a, a very brave individual or a, or a great person or, or or a hero. I don't know why you are going out in the path of Allah to give da'wah or to be called that you know you're a da'i. I don't know why you're going to Hajj. To be called a haji, like a, a person who, who performs hajj, al-hajj, or you've gone to really uh, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey his commandments. So sincerity, we can't see. But the place of sincerity is qalb, the, the heart. And that's something inward. Then stuff like patience is also considered as inward because sometimes, you know, patience needs a lot of courage, a lot of like, um, uh, it needs lots of tolerance to be patient. So patience is a great reward. And uh, sometimes we don't even think that we can get really reward from patience. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حساب. The verily, the patience rewards are unlimited. The, and the reward of patience is unlimited. There is not any limit to it. But we don't realize the patience is great reward. Again, inward. Tawakkul, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the time we can't see our trust or your trust in Allah. How you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your tawakkul, again unseen. Generosity, as-sakha, al-karam. Again something that I can't see but if you give in public then I can see you are generous. But you know that quality, that khisla, the sifa of generosity and karam. Again highly praised and highly uh, rewarding in Islam. Again considered as inward. Modesty, al-haya, modesty. And Prophet ﷺ said, al-haya u shu'batun min al-iman, the modesty is part of the faith. Again, these qualities are inward. Humbleness, how do I acquire the humbleness? At-tawadu, like to be humble, no matter how high you go, high, how, how rich you become, how educated and how knowledgeable you become, but you're still humble. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man tawadu alillah, rafa'ahu Allah. Whoever become, humbles himself for Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala elevates his status, his degrees. Then you've got stuff like asset, uh, 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 asceticism, like avoiding the dunya for the sake of akhirah. So asceticism, zuhud. Zuhud is also highly rewarding. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he could have everything in this world, but he deliberately avoided many, many things. He didn't want to be rich. That's asceticism, the al al zuhud for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, not fully going against the worldly pleasure and against the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the stuff that we can enjoy in this world, not fully against, but you prefer akhirah over the dunya. This is called um, asceticism. And then khushu' in salah, like you know, being very focused in salah and uh, standing humbly in front of Allah the Almighty. These are the stuff that we can't see, but they are known as a'mal al-batina, the inward worship or inward action. Then we have also some of the disease that people can't see in our hearts. For example, the arrogance cannot be seen. But people might be very arrogant, and arrogance is, is, is very, it's a dangerous scene. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a person who has a small grain of arrogance in his heart will not enter into Jannah. He will not even smell Jannah if he has arrogance. People uh, might have some sort of like, suwadhan. People might have uh, evil thoughts, negative thoughts about some other people. And that again, known as or considered as amrad uh, al-qulub or the part of the sickness of the heart or the disease of the heart. But we cannot see them much unless people are doing 
in public and then we can observe but originally the, the place of these things are qalb in the qalb in the soul of the people so generally just to give example the worships are categorized into two a'mal zahira a'mal batina outward inward is there any difference of opinions amongst the scholars of islam with regards to this what i mentioned according to my understanding according to my understanding i have not seen any scholar have difference or has difference of opinions regarding a'mal the, the action that i've mentioned the zahira and batina outward and inward everybody agrees the amrad al qulub everyone agrees that that needs to be treated uh, the the disease of the hearts must be treated agreed by all scholars of all lines all circles all madhahib and all maslak right now where do you find in the hadith of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, uh, with regards to the sound heart. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he um, talks about uh, the heart and the condition of the heart in the hadith, uh, mentioned in the book of Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumullah. Um, the hadith is on the authority of An-Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu anhuma, qala sami'tu Rasool Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, ala wa inna fil jasadi mudgha, that Verily, or be aware, there is a, a piece of flesh in the body, human body. If that piece of flesh is sound and healthy, the whole entire body is sound and healthy. And if that piece of flesh, the soul or the, the qalb or heart is corrupt, then the whole entire body is corrupt. And then he says, Ala wahiya al-qalb, and that is none other than the heart of a or soul of a human being. Ala wahiya al-qalb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the noble Quran about the sound heart. So he says, Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. There will be a day when no children and need no children, no wealth will benefit a human being, a believer, a person. Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. Except an individual, a person who comes with a very sound heart, a good heart, a healthy heart to Allah wa ta'ala. So the importance of a sound heart, again, agreed by all the scholars of all lines and, and all uh, sort of circles without any disagreements with the uh, importance of the sound heart. Now, so the content of Tazkiyah, or the purification of the soul, or excelling the inner dimension, betterment of the character, later, in the later era, so, so far we we're talking about the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum, and the early stage of Islam, regarding Tazkiyah, Suluk, the, uh, you know, uh, the Akhlaq, and Ruhaniyya, Tarbiyah, the spirituality, and um, training one's soul, we're talking about so far about the early stage. But this knowledge later developed into something called a tasawwuf. Have you heard of the name tasawwuf, brothers? I'm sure from the poster you've heard. But before, have you ever heard of the name tasawwuf? Anybody heard the name of tasawwuf? Please help me. Apart from the obvious scholars, <laughs> those who have studied Sheikh Ashik and Imam Asad, inshallah, yeah. Uh, apart from the scholars, do you know, uh, I mean, if you can help me with the word Tasawwuf. I think everyone knows the Sufi. Yes, okay. So people are more aware of Sufi or Sufism in English. But the Tasawwuf, where does the word Tasawwuf come from? So is that from Suf, like some scholars they say, probably is from the Suf, the wool, like what I'm wearing now. It's like a wool. So the early spiritual figures is to wear the Suf, and that's how they're known as the people of Suf or the wool. Or they come from a Sufa, from the people of Sufa, you know, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who used to sit right next to the Prophet's, Prophet's house and they used to memorize the hadith and part of the Sufa was Sayyidina Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu. Oh, is it coming from the Sufa? Or is it coming from the Greek word known as Sufiya, which means the Hikmah, the, the, the wisdom? Difference of opinions among the scholars of Islam. Some are saying that the word uh, Tasawwuf came from uh, uh, the purification, Safa, like cleansing the heart, the Safa, you know, the Saf, Saf, like in Urdu and Bengali, we say the Saf, so it's cleansing. Uh, some are saying it comes from the Greek word, like Sophia, which means the, um, the, the Hikmah, the wisdom. Others are saying it comes from the Suf, the wool. Suf means wool. 
Um, these are the difference of opinions amongst the scholars. But Imam al-Ghazali, a great scholar of the 5th century, a mujaddid of Islam, he says very clearly, what is tasawwuf? He said, at-tasawwuf shay'an. He said, tasawwuf, two things. Number one, he said, as-sidqu ma'allah, that being truthful with Allah, being sincere with Allah, being truthful to the commitments, to the duties of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, wa husnul mu'amalati ma'an nas, and being good with people. Can you imagine? Being truthful with Allah and having good relationship with people. فَكُلُّ مَنْ صَدَقَ مَعَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَأَحْسَنَ مُعَامَلَةِ الْخَلْقِ فَهُوَ سُفِي and then he goes, that whoever is sincere in worshipping Allah, in obeying Allah, and whoever is in the company of Allah at all time, and whoever is good with people, he is Sufi. He is known as a Sufi. Kadhafi khalas at tasanif And that's how he concludes by saying, this is a description of Tasawwuf, according to Imam al-Ghazali, who was a great scholar of Tasawwuf. And not only just Tasawwuf, he was a great scholar generally, a Shafi'i, Usuli, a scholar of Falsafa, whatever you name, he was an individual who was known as Mujaddid of Qarn al-Khamis, the 5th century, Imam al-Ghazali. That's according to his understanding, or according to him, the word, the meaning of Tasawwuf. And pretty much, that's how it's taken by the majority of the scholars of Tasawwuf um, later on or around that time. So have we understood the word Tasawwuf now? Is that clear? Now some of us might say, okay, look, if Tazkiyah is mentioned in the Noble Quran, and if Ihsan is mentioned in the Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then what's the point of talking about Tasawwuf? Why are we to, uh, uh, inventing a new word? Why is he that? Why do we get, bring a new word? Uh, a great scholar of India, uh, Al Imam Al Shaykh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwa Rahimullah, he wrote a book, it's called Rabbaniya La Rahbaniya, that being about Allah, like being a divine, uh, uh, like being Rabbani, like for Allah, and not like monasticism, that you completely avoid the dunya, like the monks, that they have nothing to do with the dunya and they avoid the pleasure of the world. So, Imam Abul Hassan Ali Al Nadwa, he says, the Tazkiyah and Ihsan mentioned in the, in the Quran and prophetic narration. But when the word Tasawwuf came, this is where a lot of misunderstanding started to take place. Even though the content is same and everybody agrees. And then he says in this book that I wish the scholars of the later stage didn't use the word Tasawwuf. And if they haven't used the word Tasawwuf, then probably a lot of misunderstanding would be removed by today. But however, like every knowledge, Tasawwuf, the Tazkiyah also developed to the later stage. Now, at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did we have something called Ilm al -Nahu? The, the, the grammar, Arabic grammar? No. no. Uh, at the time of Prophet did we have something called Ilm al tajweed No. Because everybody knew how to recite Quran properly. At the time of Prophet did we have Ilm al-Fiqh? The knowledge of, uh, the science of jurisprudence, al-Fiqh? No. All of these things, sciences came later on in the third or fourth century. Ilm al-Hadith, for example. Or even the compiling the Hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even the Ulum al-Hadith, the science of Hadith, these all came to the later stage. So what happened now? Scholars are saying, بعد عهد الصحابة والتابعين دخل في دين الإسلام أمم شتى وأجناس عديدة After the time of the Sahaba, companions and tabi'een, uh, a uh, uh, lot of people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities entered into Islam. And the knowledge began to expand and extend and spread. So the scholars of Islam started to uh, uh, expertise and be specially, uh, uh, you know, specialized in different, different fields. So every group uh, of the scholars, they start to write uh, their own own sort of subject and own art. والعلم الذي يجيده أكثر من غيره فنشأ بعد تدوين النحو في الصدر الأول علم الفقه وعلم التحويد والتوحيد وعلوم الحديث وصول الدين والتفسير. So different different arts and subjects developed in the later stage and they were not they didn't exist at the time of the noble prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So similarly. What we mentioned earlier, you know, the tazkiyat al-nafs, the perfection of the soul, the, the issues of heart, for example, a'mal al-ba'atina, the, the tazkiyah, the ihsan, and uh, cleansing oneself and, and getting rid of the disease of the hearts. Who is going to do that? So the scholars of that line, 
al-ruhaniya and scholars of tarbiyah they started to write that subject as ilm at-tasawwuf and they started to come, like, write the books and named imam al-ghazali rahimahullah he wrote a very important book called al-ihya ulum al-din reviving the knowledge of religion and this book is a very comprehensive book but of course it talks about uh, a lot it talks about the inward um, uh, dimension of a human body at uh, nafs so this is how the knowledge of tasawwuf developed and it became from tazkiyah al-ihsan later on it became tasawwuf or you can say sufiyah or the people who practice tasawwuf they're called sufis but normally in our society when people say sufis they kind of uh, say in a negative way sufi means like straight away instantly someone who is bad but of course we have to be fair and and just when we talk about any line or any circle there are people on, on different levels just the way we find people on different levels in in da'wah salafiyah in da'wah sufiyah in da'wah in every circle you'll find people are on different levels not everyone on the same levels and same degrees and so therefore it is an injustice to really generalize the whole entire thing now tell me a little bit about At-Turuq. What is Tariqa? Have you heard of the word called Tariqa? What is Tariqa? Like Tasawwuf and Sufiya, they have different different lines. The Tariqa. Where do they come from? Hmm. Tariqa. What's Tariqa? Brothers. Tariqa is a path. Hmm? path. Yes, Tariqa literally means a path. Yes. It's just a, it's just a line. Path. At-Tariqa. When the scholars of Tasawwuf, when they speak about Tariqa, they say, At-Tariqa هي الأصول إلى الله is to reach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to find Allah is to attain Allah the Almighty right so At-Turuq al-Sufiyya هي مدارس دينية so now this the Tariqa or the lines of Sufis or Tasawwuf however you want to name um, they are different schools uh, of purification of the souls which normally take people and connect people to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala and they generally they have the sanad al-muttasil meaning they have the chains of narration of they have this lineage or the chains so for example when you take the bay'ah when you take an oath with somebody a scholar of spirituality generally it goes back to his teacher then his teacher and then his teacher and then it goes back to uh, back through sayyidina ali ibn abi talib radiyallahu anhu and then it goes back to uh, sayyidina muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so generally they have this connection Uh, of, of, of tariqa so there are some major turuq or tariqas you find in the tasawwuf in the world of tasawwuf can you name me some of the names of the of the tariqa what are the major names of ta tariqa or the lines of, of, of tasawwuf qadiriya yes qadiriya was one of them and goes back to an imam called imam abdul qadir jilani rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'a a very famous uh, uh, iraqi hanbali scholar of islam abdul qadir jilani okay anybody else any other tariqa Do we know? Naqshbandi. Naqshbandi, yes. So this is another tariqa which goes back to Imam al-Naqshbandi. Any other tariqa? Chishtiya. Chishtiya. Ima'in al al-Chishti. Uh, and he was uh, in the Asian subcontinent. And then you've got uh, uh, Suhra Wardiya, and then you've got different, different. And then in, in the Arab volume, Shadiriya and Rifa'iya, and there are different, different tariqa and different, different lines amongst the uh, school of Tasawwuf, amongst the people of Tasawwuf. What do they do? So different schools have different courses, and generally they focus, they all focus on the purification of the soul or re taking people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, meaning like teaching you and training you and giving tarbiyah to you that how you can become a true worshiper of Allah wa ta'ala and how you can be really good to people and how you can attain all those inner qualities that I mentioned earlier those inward qualities that sometimes we can't see you cannot learn from the book for example the sincerity how can I learn unless I go to somebody who's sincere and I'm some, someone who trains me to be sincere so uh, these are the responsibilities of different turuq or the different schools of tasawwuf known as qadiriya chishtiya whatever you name or, or, or shadiliya or, or rifa'iya in in the muslim world they, they are actually they exist all over the muslim world and even in the non-muslim world so these are the different lines of of, of taruq sufiya so different tariqa is based on different courses which leads to the walaya of allah wa as the scholars of tasawwuf say now what happened what is the what what, what wrong and where did the people of tasawwuf went wrong where did they go wrong We need to understand that because like every good thing that you can't you find like a duplicate dodgy 
bad things, deviance come in. And we cannot blame the whole entire thing for that. Just because some Muslims are doing wrong things, we can't say Islam is bad. Like some, do, some people are prejudiced against Islam. Just because some people are doing mistakes, we can't say Islam is bad. Now, don't forget what I mentioned earlier. Tazkiyah, Ihsan, then don't forget the Sauv I mentioned. There is some sort of connection, right? Um, now, where did the difference come from in Tasawwuf? So people who are against Islam, they found ways, the ways to come into these different different lines and they tried to act like they are Muslims and they're good people, but actually they started to deviate and teach people the wrong things, the wrong belief and wrong aqidah. Take the example, some people are known as al-Batiniyya. They said, look, you know, this is called Ilm al-Batin, you don't know, you people don't know, only the scholars, they know everything. And they won't, they won't tell you. And you can find some of this understanding and, 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 and teaching in Shia schools as well. So what they would say, like when you go and ask them, like what do you mean by that? They would say, this is, you know and understand. This is the Ilm of batin we know it. And they're not going to tell everything. And this is how they bring a lot of corruption and a lot of deviances and talal and khurafat to, to Islam. And this is called like Batini. And Throughout the history, a lot of people came into the schools of Tasawwuf and they kind of uh, polluted these um, teachings of, of Tazkiyah and teaching of Ihsan from the Noble Prophet Some of them start to believe reincarnation. Like I have heard somebody actually speaking and this person is from, from Bangladesh. And the guy was saying, you know what, I have become ilah wal billah. He said that you know, Allah has come into my form. Divinity, is crazy. he's claiming to be divine, divinity. Well, this is from Christianity and Hinduism. And the guy is saying, I'm the best Sufi. And then you find people like those who give the guarantees. They say, you know what, if you come to me, I'll take you to Jannah. It's like you get the ticket of Jannah if you come to me. And they give you complete insurance and, and confirmation, and they'll take you to Jannah. And so this is again uh, uh, very strange. These beliefs came into the Tasawwuf, and they claim to be the people of Tasawwuf. Have you seen like some of you probably go to uh, 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 our countries and maybe like you know uh, Muslim world and you find the tombs and what people are doing sometimes very funny things sometimes people actually go and do uh, the salah towards the Qabr and I'm sure no reliable scholars of Islam would agree with that as long as they're reliable scholars they do and do the praying salah and some of them are actually because due to the ignorance and jahala they're doing this because they don't know and others are being misguided by their leaders unfortunately so you see and then people you find that people are dancing i've seen people dancing in such a way it's very some scholars i know some scholars uh, that debate about like some sort of respectful dancing uh, like movements not dancing sorry movements but i have seen like some weird dancing check the uh, check check youtube and this is like what people are doing like it's very weird it's funny even if you show it to children they laugh and if if children laugh at anything just know it's funny <laughs> because they wouldn't laugh unless it's really really funny so um so you see th these people are like dancing and going around the circle and then the guy starts dancing and come to the sheikh and he kisses his hand and his feet and then go back again where did what kind of teaching of the soul these are not teaching of the soul wallahi i mean uh, according to all reliable scholars of islam and then you find people um uh, uh, you know who, who take the clothes off have you seen the people who take the clothes off and then they start jumping and they say the big dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how can this be a dhikr the while you are you you took your clothes clothes off and i have heard uh, in in some of the countries like they say lang uh, tafir have you heard of that? Like, he's like a naked uh, uh, spiritual figure. Apparently, he's a length of it. <laughs> How can this person be free while he's, he doesn't have the clothes, the basic necessities? So we find this kind of uh, strange things in the, in the, in the circles of Tasawwuf, or claiming to be the people of Tasawwuf. But in reality, uh, if Imam al-Ghazali was here today, he would say this is wrong. Imam Abdul Qadir Jilani was there, he would say it's wrong. All the big scholars of Tasawwuf, if they were here today, if Imam uh, uh, Qasim Nanutubi was, he would say it's wrong. Ashraf Ali Tanabi if he was here, he would say it's wrong. All of them would uh, deny and reject this sort of like activities that is being done in the name of Tasawwuf. And these actually gave a bad name to the Tasawwuf uh, uh, or to the people of Tasawwuf, I believe. And so what happened? By looking into these strange activities by some of the Sufi or those who claim to be Sufi, and I believe, in my opinion, a true Sufi individual will not say he's a Sufi. Someone who's really a person of Tasawwuf will not say I'm Sufi. Why? Because to get to the stage, Really, it takes a lot of hard work. It's not an easy thing. Struggle, sacrifice, tadhiyya. You have to really tadhiyya. You have to 
to get to that stage, you need lots of exercise and a lot of hard work. It's not easy to be just saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a person of Tasawwuf. No. True scholars of Tasawwuf never say they're the people of Tasawwuf. In fact, they would deny. They would say, I'm nothing. I don't know much. I don't worship Allah enough. That's how they would say. Even Imam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he encouraged that. He even said that, you know, I don't even know how to worship Allah properly. And you know how Imam Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, was a great scholar of Islam. And that's how they present themselves. But what happened is, later on, a lot of people in the Muslim world started to misunderstand the whole entire content and the concept of the, of the soul, and they started to reject it fully and deny it fully. Forgetting the fact that actually the content of the soul is the tazkiyat nafs is the purification of the soul, is al-ihsan, which is mentioned in the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very unfair to generalize anything, uh, any subject in Islam. Rather, we should remain open and be fair and um, judge everybody accordingly, every circle. Within one circle, you've got people of different levels and different understanding and um, we should not. It's a great mistake to actually uh, generalize because we'll really be accountable in front of Allah Taala. Ta so again, now what is uh, Imam, uh, a great scholar uh, of India, uh, and not only just India, of the Muslim world, known as Hakim al-Ummat Mawlana Ashabali Ta'anawi Rahmanullah, he gives uh, again what is Tasawuf. He says what Tasawuf is. Because don't forget, he was a great scholar of that line in the Asian subcontinent. He revived that, that knowledge in the Asian subcontinent. So Imam Ash-Shafali al-Tanabi rahimahullah, he says in his book, Ta'alim al-Din, with regards to rectifying the mistake, there is no need to adhere to the Sharia uh, in Tasawwuf. It is mentioned in Al-Futuhat, the haqiqa of Tasawwuf that is against the Sharia is irreligious, irreligious and rejected. Whatever is against Sharia, the teaching of Allah and His Messenger وسلم, is not Tasawwuf. This is Imam Shafali uh, al-Tanawi rahmahullah saying. And then he said, it is also mentioned there, whoever says that he, here is the path to Allah different to what Sharia has outlined, then he said, this, is, this person has lied. So sometimes, some people say like, you know, we don't need Sharia. As long as we have ma'rifah, we have the recognition of Allah, we can get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they reject completely the Sharia. Some of the people are like that. And I know somebody like mentioned, and you can easily find them, a guy, he's, he claims to be the person of tasawwuf, the spirituality. And then the guy never prays salah. One day he was asked, why, are you, why don't you pray? You say you're the, you're the biggest um, scholar and the, uh, the spiritual figure, but why, how come you don't pray? He goes, I'm praying in Makkah. I don't have to pray. Like he's saying in his mind, apparently he's, in, he's praying in Makkah al Mukarramah while he's here. So this kind of thing, shatahat, you find amongst this line, and some people have mistaken, and others took it as business. You know, you see some people also, the commercial side also plays a vital role. So when you go to the Muslim world, and you can find some of the tombs, do you know who control these tombs? Well, you go to these tombs and you find these tombs are controlled by some of the business people, and they are multi-millionaires. Don't go far, just go to Darga and Silet, and you'll find the people who control and those who monitor and take care of the Darga. These people have heard, I might be wrong, I've heard that these people are very, very rich, and some of them are not even practicing. You see, why well, they revive this Qubur for their own benefit, for their own uh, fa'idah, uh, and therefore for their own business. And so, business also came in, the commercial side came in, and also there is another side of it tied to the, the, the people of the soul. So sometimes you find some of the people of the soul that they tend to deny, not maybe verbally, but in the action, deny the other aspects of Islam. Don't forget, Islam is a complete code of life. It's a comprehensive religion. It has the mu'amala, the dealing and transaction. It's got, it has mu'ashara, public relation. It has siyasa, even like how to be in the ruling position. It has all those sides. It has also defending the Muslims. Right. So sometimes what happens, some of the people of Tasawwuf, in some stage, they have completely rejected in their action that there's no need for the other sides of the Islam. And so that's where a lot of uh, people of power used, again, some of the people of Tasawwuf, uh, you know, for their own favor and to get things done uh, however they want to do. Now, um, let's just see Imam. A great scholar known as Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, who many people respect and, and revere and love, and we all respect him, he was a great scholar. Right, if you look at the teaching of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and his student, Ibn Al-Qayyim al jawzi have you heard of a book called Madarij al-Salikin? Huh? Have you heard of a book called Madarij al-Salikin? 
It's a great famous book amongst all uh, uh, scholars and especially amongst the, the, the brothers who, um, who, 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 who tend to follow the school of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi. But the book, book is really good. It's called Madarij al-Salikin by Ibn Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi. Do you know what this book is? Where does it come from? Actually, it's a sharh. It's a commentary on a book called Manazil al-Sairin. It's a commentary of a book on a book called Manazil al-Sairin and that's written by someone called Imam al-Harawi. And Imam al-Harawi was a humble scholar, but also actually he had contribution to Tasawwuf. He was known uh, in, in, in his work, and he was known for his work in the field of Tazkiyah, purification of the soul, and Ihsan, and, and, and Tasawwuf. And Manazil al-Sairin, it is the book Imam al-Qayyim al jawzi he gave a commentary, and he named it as Madarij al-Salikin. Now everybody reads that book, but nobody denies and disagrees with that book. Right? But if it was, for example, written by a scholar like Abdul Qadir al Jilani, then they would say, finish, like, don't read it. And that's the end of it. Now, I mean, this is a reality that we are seeing. And we find the same thing on the other side as well. Just because it comes from the other line, we're not going to read it completely. Just, just end of it. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, if you look at his teaching, if you look at his books, then you find that tazkiyah is there, is dhahir, is apparent in his books. And even Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, when he spoke about the mashayikh of a Sufiyyah, you know how he used to address? Check his book called Majmu' Al-Fiqh of Imam, Majmu' Al-Fiqh of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. When he speaks, sorry? Majmu' Al-Fatawa. Yeah, Majmu' Al-Fatawa, When he speaks in this book, he says, وَقَالَ مَشَايِخِ السُّفِيَّةِ and then he addressed and he mentions the opinions of, of all those mashayikh of Sufiya. He doesn't reject them fully. Believe me, go and check. And I have seen with my own eyes, uh, one of my teachers was telling me, and I have seen it. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, he speaks about them very beautifully and respectfully. And as I said, Ibn Qayyim al jawzi he even gave the commentary of, of Madarij al-Salikin on Manazil al-Sairin by Imam al-Harawi. I have seen some of the scholars in, the, in Egypt and in other parts of the world, and they're from different lines. So you talk about Mashaykh of Salafiya, Mashaykh of Sufiya. Some of the Mashaykh of Salafiya I have seen, honestly, when I saw them, I thought that they're Sufi Shaykhs. Why? Because when you look at them, they have the teachings of Tasawwuf and Tazkiyat al Nafs, as I have mentioned. Because the content is one, the subject is one, there's no difference originally. And I found some of the scholars in Egypt, they really exactly to me, they were like Sufi Mashaykh. But actually, they're Salaf Shuyukh. And, and again, I think there's a huge, there's a knot we need to untie that knot uh, and where these people are mistaken this misunderstanding huge misunderstandings between all lines and there's a lot of political issues as well behind this war and battle that is taking place between all these different lines but or originally believe me um, the teaching of all those lines it just the difference is some scholars would say okay like you we need to do this get nafs but through teaching you go to the scholar scholar will tell you like you know quran and sunnah and hadith and he will teach you and that's it but other scholars will give you some of the courses he will say okay do this much dhikr do this this much quran do this much ibadah he will give you some courses and until you get to a stage where you can do a lot of ibadah by yourself meaning he will try to take you to the unlimited ibadah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Noble Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu dhkuru allaha dhikran kathira. Or you believe, remember Allah immensely unlimited, kathir, there's no limit to it. Allah. And to get to that stage, we need help. And the helpers are the teachers. And so um, really, in reality, in practical life, you don't find much difference. It's just the words, just the terms, just the names. And according to Imam uh, Abu Hassan Ali al-Nadabi, who really said he was uh, a great scholar, and he was right when he said, I wish that you know, the scholars of early stage, they just could keep the name Tazkiyah. And that way, nobody would say, okay, this is innovation, this is a new word, why are you using Tasawwuf, why are you using the Sufi, and that would just remain as it is. But I have mentioned there are differences, there are corruption, there are mistakes came in to the lines of Tasawwuf. And as I said, in every good action, in every good thing, you will find bad things. People will come and pollute and try to make things wrong. And then, you know, people start judging and giving a bad name to the whole entire line or to the whole entire organization or to the whole entire da'wah itself. Spiritual figures are behind every major movement in this world. Believe me, you need ha we need to have spirituality, the ruhaniya. Check the, for example, some of the major muqawama that took place, the resistance. Al-Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, who actually fought against the French invasion, was a very famous spiritual scholar, Al-Amir Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi. Al-Sanusi, someone called Al-Sanusi, was also a great. Umar al-Mukhtar, 
some of the great Umar Muhtashi may not be spiritual, I'm not too sure, but Sanusi was a great scholar again and, and, and a spiritual figure. Salahuddin al Ayyubi was also spiritual. And even with, of course, like um, with all controversy and differences, uh, even uh, Imam Hassan al Banna, who founded the, uh, the Jama'at al Khwan, he was also a spiritual individual, if you look at it. He used to attend the, 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 the Adhkar and Halaqat as well. So if you go back to his history, now as I said, with all differences and controversy, again you find the people behind all major movements, you'll find the spiritual individuals, spiritual figures, because you need to have the Ruhaniya. Dry people can't do much. And also behind the spread and behind the growth and expansion of Islam, you find the scholars of Tasawuf played a vital role. And as I said, when we say Tasawuf, it doesn't go out of the fold of Islam. Now, um, someone called, uh, I'm sure you've heard someone called Shah Jalal Rahimahullah. Have you heard of Shah Jalal Rahimahullah? Yes. Yeah, anybody who's Bangladesh will know. And even outside Bangladesh you will know. Shah Jalal Rahimahullah was someone called Jalaluddin ibn Mahmud al-Mahalli Rahimahullah. And he came from Hadramaut in Yemen to all the way through Chichagang to Silat and he's buried in Silat. Who was Shah Jalal Rahimahullah? He was a great spiritual individual. And because of him today, we can see we're Muslims, people of Bengal. We are proud to be Muslims. Why? Because of these individuals, their sacrifice, their hard work, their da'wah, their, you know, their tafhiyah, they, they, they were, they spread all over the world. Shah Jalal rahimahullah, we remember him. And inshallah, perhaps we can do a talk on him. I was, uh, inshallah, planning and intending to do a talk on Shah Jalal rahimahullah because there's a need for the youngsters to know about Shah Jalal rahimahullah because there's a huge contribution of Shah Jalal rahimahullah on the Muslims of the Bay of Bengal. And you find uh, people like those uh, who spread Islam across the world, you find the, the people of actually Ruhaniya, the spirituality, the speakers, people of Akhlaq and people of, uh, of Tazkiyah, they're the one who went all over the world and spread Islam. And hence you find within the Muslim world, you find uh, the public and the population of the Muslims, they have a connection with the Tasawwuf or Tazkiyah somehow. Even though some of them are mistakes and some of them are right, but you find there's a connection. You go to Egypt, Morocco, Indonesia, Malaysia, Bangladesh, <coughs> Pakistan, even in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, it was the condition, but there's some change. But of course, um, it was like that as well in Saudi Arabia. So you find the reason why it happened. I'm just giving a historical uh, fact or background. The reason why you find that connection, because Islam was spread through these individuals. So uh, in my conclusion, what I want to say, that the names can be different. It can be Tazkiyah, it can be Ihsan, it can be Tasawwuf, it can be Sufiya, yes, but the content will need to remain with the content of the Quran and Sunnah of the Noble Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And whatever you name, we must attain that quality, we must actually find Allah wa Ta'ala and we must be a true worshipper and we must reach to that stage where he says that you worship Allah as if you can see him and if you couldn't see him Allah is watching you at all time we have to get to that stage by the way because this is a, a commandment commandment of the noble prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and every major mainstream religion actually aims to take us to the um, company of Allah wa Ta'ala at all time i hear Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be a true, sincere, truthful worshippers of Allah the Almighty and to understand the facts and to minimize the differences amongst the Muslims and to go back to inshallah the original sources, whatever the names and whatever the means and whatever the circles or uh, the terms could be, but ultimately we go back to uh, the teaching of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I hope the subject has been uh, uh, clear, but uh, I know it's a very profound and very complex subject. I was really fearing how I can uh, uh, address and how I can actually talk about this subject but possibly we have learned something today which is khairan for listening attentively again if I have offended anybody uh, you know this wasn't my intention I do ask forgiveness and I ask uh, forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for any mistake that I've made and I'm open to the guidance if there is anything inshallah haq. later I'm open to the guidance which is khairan shukran jazeelan jazakallah khairan to the chef for his insightful talk on the topic of tasawwur um, I hope we have all benefited from this. Um, so now we're going to take some questions. So please raise your hands to ask any questions uh, on this topic, please. Yes, brothers, if you have any question, feel free to ask any question, inshallah, you may have. Alaikum salam wa barakatuh. 
I have uh, some spiritual scholars. They go to one, they, they go from one place to another place. Mm -hmm. So quickly, can can we can that be helpful for the genes? Okay, so you, this what? question is about karama. Yeah. Uh, that uh, the brother is saying that he had the some scholars that they can travel very quickly from one place to another place. Now karama is uh, a, is, is, is a subject that is agreed by all the scholars of Al-Sunnah al jamaa Even though some may be minority rejected, but majority of the scholars accept the, the karama. Karama is something that can be done by individuals who are not prophets, other than prophets, but they can do some extraordinary work which others can't do. And that's due to the spiritual power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them. So that's again by the will of Allah and by the power of Allah. Now you can see, uh, in, the, in, the, in the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sahaba, amongst the Sahaba, the karama happened and it's all accepted. When um, uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, uh, he had Yasariyat al-Jabal. He had from far, uh, there was not any kind of media or anything at that time, and he had from really far distant part, he had in the other Sahabas talking. So this is mentioned. And so the karamatul awliya, uh, this is accepted by the majority scholars of Islam. And so therefore, some of the incidents that happen, it may be possible. We don't have to believe in that individual, or we don't have to even say like, it's lie or wrong, because it's possible to happen. So, inshallah, jazakallah khair. And I've seen another clip, yeah. seen, as you said, hmm. uh, the program the Sufis, hmm. but they think it takes place. And they touch the main person, hmm. sitting on the chair, and as soon as he touches him, Take this by like Hadouki. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> right. So you, you find this, as I said, like some of the strange things that happen, and we see this uh, in some circles. But I think mainly they go back to <laughs> they go back to they go back to the lack of knowledge. I think when see a, a, an issue like tas tas to nafs and an issue like dawa. If there is not much knowledge, then they can go to different different levels. And they have to be led, and they have to be really taught and educated by the scholars, the ulama. And this is the reason why if the sawf is led by non-scholars, then soon it will be a deviance. And I found people like that. Even within the people of those who say we are people of haqq, you see, because the person, individual, is not a knowledgeable alim, then he starts, shaitan comes into him. Because knowledge can only protect a person from shaitan. Because knowledge is very powerful. And this is the reason why, you know, knowledge really protect and, and shield, is a shield of, of an individual, of an abid. So without knowledge, we can easily can go wrong. And so this is the reason why, a abid without knowledge, uh, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, says, al-ilmu bil amalin kal junoon that uh, ilm, knowledge without practice is like madness. وَالْعَمَلُ بِلَا عِلْمٍ لَا يَكُونَ And he said, and practice without knowledge is invalid. It's not going to happen. So um, ilm comes and knowledge comes ev before everything. Sharia. Ah. Of course, sharia, ah, tasawwuf, tazkiya, ihsan needs to be led by and controlled by the sharia. Ah, otherwise, we'll soon go to the wrong path. And this is what happens to many people. Sometimes they're very sincere. Honestly, when you go to them, they really believe in this. But maybe they're doing the wrong things, their actions are wrong, but they're probably thinking they're doing the right things. So therefore, the scholar's contribution are highly needed. And so I think if anybody wants to go to a scholar, I mean, a, a person of spirituality, I would say it's very important to find a scholar, a good scholar. And at the same time, he has that line. So there's a less possibility of, of deviance in, in, in it. Shakarallah alaikum. Anything else? Yeah, anything that I said like wasn't clear? Alhamdulillah, wa barakallahu feekum, inshaAllah. Hmm? As you mentioned, uh, we can see that also many Islamic countries have indeed been there. Uh, what did you see the practice of Tasawf in Middle Eastern countries, particularly in Saudi Arabia? And I think uh, the, the, the moderation and the deviance happen in every place, more or less. Even in the Arab world, you find those who are doing like some of the weird things. So just because people are Arab doesn't mean that um, you know, uh, they somehow, you know, it doesn't really, the, nation, the, the race doesn't mean that, you know, they are somehow like more superior or better. It's about knowledge. So sometimes you find some of the in Arabs, they're very, ignore, like, they have no knowledge. The people of uh, Jahan, in there as well, just like we have as well in this side or in different parts in the Europe and in, the, in Asia and in the Arab world. So it's pretty much similar. The, the, you'll find people of, on different levels. 
people on, on different different levels. And I see if anybody knows how to read Arabic, then they should read this book called Rabbaniya La Rahbaniya by Sheikh Abdul Hassan Ali al Nadawi. A very moderate position, but don't forget he was also a scholar of spirituality, Sheikh Abdul Hassan Ali al Nadawi. And of course, we find there are many good scholars like, you know, recently Sheikh Abdul Halim Mahmoud from Al Azhar. A great scholar of Al Azhar, ex um, uh, Sheikh Al Azhar, and also people like Shah Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda was a great scholar from Syria, uh, you know, a great individual. So these are the people we find they actually try to uh, practice these lines in a very scholastic, in a very moderation, in a uh, balanced way, uh, and that needs to be done in this uh, manner, inshallah. Wa shukrallahu lakum. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب رب اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما والله فقيف السنز والله you created us you sent us to this world you gave us everything that we need we are extremely ungrateful to you at all time so we are repenting to you tonight in this occasion forgive our sins grant us all the goodness in this world and in the next world increase our love and love all the prophets in our hearts and give us the ability to worship you that we will be happy with us Wa oh Allah, unite the hearts of all Muslims. Unite the hearts of Ummah. Wa oh Allah, raise the status of Islam and Muslim. Help the Muslims across the world, all over the world, and establish your deen on this earth. Wa oh Allah, wa oh Allah, um, uh, bestow your mercy upon the graves of all our diseased people, Mayyiteen. Wa oh Allah, especially on the, on, the, on the grave of our parents. Rabbi rahmhuma kama rabbayana sigara. Rabbi rahmhuma kama rabbayana sigara. Rabbi rahmhuma kama rabbayana sigara. Wa oh Allah, accept our efforts. Give us sincerity. Sincerity. Wa Allah, give, grant us the ni'mah of ikhlas and sincerity. Wa Allah, accept this, accept this event. Whoever comes and attend and contribute towards this event, grant them all the goodness in this world and in the next world. Wa Allah, accept our efforts. Wa Allah, accept the efforts of Al Falak Dawah Project and all the Islamic circles and all the Islamic organizations and uh, and lines. Wa Allah, accept the efforts and grant them and uh, grant them all the goodness. Inshallah. Wa Allah. Oh Allah, help all Muslims all over the world. Oh Allah, raise the status of Islam and Muslim. Wa sallallahu wa sallama ala nabiyyina wa habibina wa shafi'ina wa qurrat a'yunina maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ameen.